group of monks were once going to go, out, <coughs> go to an outlying area of India. And so they paid their respects to Sariputta. And he asked them, when you go there, the people there are intelligent. If they ask you what your teacher teaches, what are you going to say? I remember that Sarbuddha himself once asked that question of Asaji, and he got that famous teaching, all things that arise from a cause, their cause and their cessation. That's the teaching of the, ta ta the Tagata, the great contemplative. And that was enough for him to gain the, gain the Dharma eye. But the answer that he recommended the monks give to the people in that outlying district was different. He said, the very first thing is, our teacher teaches dispassion. Now a lot of people would stop right there, because dispassion sounds kind of negative. It sounds like disillusionment, resignation. You looked around and see the things of the world don't come up to your expectations for them, and you just kind of give up having expectations. But this, that's not what dispassion means. We get it confused with sangwega, and it's important to understand the difference. Sangwega is when you see how disillusioned you are in life, but there's also a sense of being trapped. You want something better than this, but you can't see any way out. That's because there are still things in there that we're feeding on, or we'd like to feed on, in terms of relationships, in terms of power, whatever. The things we'd like to emotionally feed on, in terms of other people, things. The reason we feel trapped is because there's part of us that's still in there. It's like that famous monkey trap where they put a hole in a coconut, and then they put something inside the coconut that the monkey wants. And it can reach its hand in, but once it has its hand wrapped around the object, it can't get its hand out, and it's trapped. That's Sangwega. You look around and there's nowhere in the world that you can see any, any way out. Everybody's fighting over what little piece of food there is, emotional or physical. The Buddha's image is fish fighting over that last gulp of water before they're all going to die. And it's terrifying. That's what Sangwega literally means. We sometimes translate it as dismay, sometimes urgency. But the word originally comes from a sense of terror. You're trapped. You need a way out. That's what Pasada provides, the sense of confidence. Yes, there is a way out. That takes some of the heaviness away from that sense of terror. Then turns it into a motivation to practice. Because you realize aside from the path, there's really nothing. So it allows you to put all your energy and pay all your attention to following the path. Now, the one thing that gets in the way, though, is that sense of confusing Sangwega with dispassion. We're developing this path all the way to what? Dispassion? The mind asks that, and it recoils a little bit, because it keeps confusing it with Sangwega. Dispassion is when you no longer need to feed on these things, the things of the world. It comes from disenchantment, nibida. And Nibida basically relates to this image of feeding. You've had enough of the food and you don't want any more. You don't feel a need anymore to feed off these things, which allows you to stop creating all the fabrications you do around the world that try to dress up the food out there. And what follows is, dispass is dispassion. And that's not a negative thing. In fact, it opens up to something much bigger. Occasionally they talk about 
an arhat is someone with no expectations. It sounds pretty bad, but that's because he doesn't need expectations anymore. He's found something much better. One of the differences, another difference between sangwega and dispassion is that with sangwega you need something to cure it, whereas with dispassion there's no cure, because you don't need a cure. It's good in and of itself. As the Buddha said, it is the ultimate dhamma. So as we're practicing, we're going to keep these two concepts separate and work on that problem, that there's still something in that coconut that we want to hold on to. And you have to ask yourself what it is, why you're holding on. The whole irony about that monkey trap, and it really works, is that all that monkey would have to do is let go of the object inside of the coconut and be free. But it's so fixated on the fact that once that little object, it's trapped, can't get away. So you have to ask yourself, what are you still holding on to? This is one of the reasons we practice concentration, is to get the mind quiet so you can really observe what's going on. And see that when the mind moves to something, why is it moving there? We practice concentration together with the restraint of the senses. All based on that principle that the Buddha taught to Rahula, the very first thing, the principle of truthfulness. Why are you going for something? What's the allure? You have to learn how to be frank with yourself about that, so you know exactly where you have to chip away. What is it about that little fruit that's inside the coconut shell that you're holding on to, where you feel that you can't let it go? So we get the mind quiet, not just to have the mind quiet. And there's a sense of well-being that comes from that. But it's not the escape. The escape is developing that sense of disenchantment, seeing that you don't need to feed off that allure anymore. Partly because you can see that you got something better, and partly because you see there's really not much there. And take heart at the same time in realizing that there at the end of the path is not a gray, dull area. It's total freedom. And John Lee talks about this in the very end of the his book on the frames of reference, getting to the ultimate dharma of dispassion. We see the clear line between what's fabricated and what's unfabricated, and the mind goes beyond everything into total freedom. The people who have reached that point would never ever want to go back to their old attachments. There's no nostalgia at all. Resignation has nostalgia. This doesn't have any nostalgia. So you can take heart in the fact that this path leads to a really good place. And it may be difficult, and there may be times when it really goes against the grain. But the goal is much better than anything you can imagine. Partly because our imagination tends to revolve around things that we can feed on. If you can't feed on this relationship, how about feeding on that power? How about feeding on that status? Or how about feeding on praise from other people? The mind tends to go just around different sources of food, and its imagination gets confined to those things. So even though you don't get to nirvana, you don't get to dispassion just by imagining it, at least, at least you have to imagine that it's good, and that it is better than you can imagine. And that can provide a lot of the motivation for sticking with the path and really committing yourself to it. 